Today, we're going inside the XFL 1.0. If you smell what the XFL is cooking. And I've got the inside stories coming up right now. So it was the premiere of the XFL, and I was sitting at home waiting to play a game the next day. We were going to play the LA Extreme. And I'm watching the New York Hitmen play the Las Vegas Outlaws. First televised broadcast, first game of the XFL. And as I watched it, as a quarterback in the league, I didn't know whether to be excited or embarrassed to be part of the league. There was all the low-angle shots of the cheerleaders, but there was some pretty good football, too, and some pretty good football players. Offenses weren't there yet, but you could tell that these guys on the field could play. Hey, everybody, I'm Mike Pulaski. 11-year pro quarterback, former XFL quarterback, and quarterback's coach here at EliteAthletesTV.com. Today, I want to talk about my experience in the XFL 1.0. That's right, the league, the initial league that Vince McMahon founded, based from World Wrestling Federation, with a bunch of good pro players, good coaches, trying to put together a spring league to fill the void left by the USFL. Before I get started, make sure you subscribe, ring that bell, Give me a thumbs up and leave me a comment down below. I'd love to hear from you. Don't forget, share this video out. We'd love to grow this channel as much as possible. The more you share it out, the more we can do that, the more young athletes we can help. We've got a viewer question today from Rangers King 669 said, would love to see a vid about your time in the 01 XFL and maybe, just maybe one day, a video breaking down quarterback play in the XFL 2.0 revival in 2022. So going into week one, the world was looking forward to seeing what the XFL was all about. A lot of hype, Vince McMahon, World Wrestling Federation, a bunch of pro wrestlers, Dick Butkus involved. So there was a bunch of people involved with this league. I had had the whole journey. I was the first round pick by the XFL Demons, number one guy drafted in San Francisco. And I, I had been through this journey of my initial workout being at a high school field going to league offices down in Mountain View, California, and then having the league offices move up to Walnut Creek. On the West Coast, we had Las Vegas, we had San Francisco, we had LA, and we all went to camp in Las Vegas. All the East Coast teams went to camp in Atlantic City. The reason they did that was because they wanted to validate the league with the gamblers, with the bookmakers, because if you couldn't bet on it, It wasn't really a professional sport. And so Vince McMahon, really smart, put the league for camp in those two different cities where you had all the bookmakers, all the bookies, all the guys that were going to set up the gambling on the league. We had to stay in the Palace Station Hotel. Now, all of the teams in the XFL that were in camp at that time had to stay in one of the station hotels. I think the Palace Station was the oldest of the station hotels, and it was miserable. Imagine a month in Vegas for camp, so two-a-days, and you're staying in a hotel where I literally felt like I smoked a pack of cigarettes every time I went from my room to our meeting rooms or my room to a meal. And on top of that, we're having buffet-style food, Vegas buffet-style food, at a station casino for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So as a player, it wasn't the most conducive to having a great, healthy camp. People may not know this. You think of Vegas, you think of the sun, the desert, and it's like 100 million degrees in the summer. But in the winter, it gets super, super cold. And so we're back there freezing our butts off, eating crappy buffet food, having meetings in a casino, feeling like I've become a fully addicted smoker, and trying to go through a football camp. Now, that said, the thing I loved about the XFL is our coaches – were great, really good coaches. My quarterback coach and offensive coordinator in particular, Joe Pow Pow, was a fantastic dude. Former quarterback himself in the CFL, set all kinds of records up there, played at Long Beach State, uh, was a really good coach, had been around for a long time, really good dude. Our head coach, Jim Skipper, was also a really, really good dude, and I'll get a little bit more about Skip later on. But so I felt like our coaches were really good. They were pros. They were all about being professional, in spite of the fact that it wasn't necessarily the most professional setting they had us in. They were all about being professional with the players and treating the players like pros. Now, these guys that were in these leagues, these players, we had a bunch of guys that were either had been in the NFL for a long time. We had Dwayne Harper, who had been in the league for like 13 years. 
Uh, we had Scott Adams, who'd been a lineman in the league for like six. And so there was a bunch of guys who had played at the NFL level. I'd played for the Bucks, And then we had guys who were bubble guys who were right there, a step slow, maybe a couple inches short, guys that weren't quite that NFL mold, but were really, really good football players. So what you had was a league where NFL is the echelon, right? Everybody wants to be in the NFL. That's the, that's the peak. That's the pinnacle. But this was way better than college football players. And now I played in the Pac-10, and we had really good teams at that time. Uh, Washington won a national champion. We were seventh in the country when I was a senior. But the XFL had really, really good football players in it. What happens in football at any level is the defense always gels first. They have single assignments by position, get your gap, you know, contain, play this coverage, and you get there first because it's on aggression and technique, where the offense has to gel because it has to do with timing and chemistry and everything else, understanding where routes are going to be run when you're throwing passes. And so defenses always gel first. So in camp, you knew that the offenses weren't going to be very good coming out. And none of the quarterbacks in camp looked very good because defenses were ahead. None of the offensive lines had ever worked together. So protection wasn't great. We weren't able to run the ball very effectively. The receivers were trying to get to know the offense. And so offenses were going to sputter. And if you know anything about football, you know that. And so early on in the league, it was not a high-scoring league. It had great talent, but it was not going to be a high-scoring league because defenses always came together first. So now let's get back to game day. We're going in to play the LA Extreme for our first game. Tommy Maddox, who I played against in college, was the quarterback for the Extreme. Obviously, I was a quarterback for the Demons. And one of the things that the league tried to get us to do was to create hype around the games. They wanted us to talk trash. They wanted us to create controversy, do all of these things. And they asked us to do these. Well, Tommy, super nice guy, really good quarterback. I knew him, like I said, from college. We were on the same trading card coming out of college. And so I knew Tommy from a long way back. And he's a mild-mannered guy. Uh, I was always one to talk a little bit of trash. And so the producers came and asked me to create controversy and stir things up. And I talked much sh before the game. They play this out loud. They come and interview me about Tommy Maddox. And I do this big spiel about never having lost to Tommy. Mike Pulaski talked before the game, said he's had your number. Does he have your number right now? No. I think he's a little pissed off. He, he doesn't have his, known book, uh, his number, but he's got the phone book. Luckily for me, we went on to win that game. We were actually behind. And we had just signed Calvin Schexnader that week. We were looking for receivers, trying to figure out that final spot on the roster. And I told our coaches, you got to go get shakes because this dude was a stud. Didn't really know the offense, which I wouldn't expect him to. But we were behind. We're trying to drive the ball. And I told him, I pulled him aside. I said, hey, you're going to run high motion. I want you to go out there, shake your ass, break that DB's kneecaps, and hit the corner. Give me a good backside Tampa. Doubles left. 69, Connie. All oh, right. Would you gun, like to see gun. LA blitz more? San Francisco like was phenomenal as a fan base. They had, they filled the stadium every single time we had a game. They were loud. They were football savvy. It was an awesome place to play. And so the tension was up. You know, everybody's going nuts. Huge jumbotron inside the stadium. And we're driving to win this game. So I drop back, boom. He goes down, he breaks that defensive back ankles. Come on. Nine you're playing linebacker, you're against a passing team. That's where you're going to get a chance to hit somebody. Third and 10. Pulaski going into the end zone. Down in the corner, put it outside. Touchdown, big time. This week, Boz. 32 yard down. Touchdown catch. You got to love it, San Francisco. Calvin Schexnader, 32-yard pass from Mike Pulaski. The Polish rifle to Schexnader. He threw a howitzer. Huge deal for the XFL, for San Francisco, win that first game in front of that fan base, and it was awesome. Let's go crazy! <laughs> Felt like, all right, this is for real. It's a great league. We're going to get something going. Offenses aren't quite there yet, but we'll get there eventually. Now, at this point, too, I think it's important for me to say 
there were two quarterbacks in San Francisco. There were myself and Pat Barnes. And it was a tough competition in camp, head-to-head. Uh, either one of us could have easily won that job. And I think they went with me, savvy vet, a bunch of starts in the Arena League, uh, six years older, kind of some experience under my belt. But Pat could have easily been the starter for us, and he would have been the starter anywhere else in the league. And he was like another coach in the quarterback room with me. He was he was the first guy I talked to when I came off the field. And so having him there, always kind of pushing me, having him there as another coach and a really good friend, he was a Cal quarterback too, and I covered his games when he played, so I was actually a big Pat Barnes fan, um, was a huge asset to me as a quarterback. So then we go on a two-game road trip, and it's Orlando and Memphis. In the Orlando game, I actually tear cartilage in my left knee. So I didn't miss a snap, kept playing through it. But when we get up to Mississippi, we're actually staying in Tunica, Mississippi. I go get an MRI, and I've got torn cartilage in my knee. During the week, though, it was another week of staying in casinos. So we finish out that road trip, and we come back home. We're 2-1, and one, and we're playing Las Vegas Outlaws. Now, Vegas, we knew this in camp. Their defense was really good. They had some studs up front could get after the passer. They had a former 11-year NFL linebacker. Kurt Gouveia, 36 years of age, long-time NFLer. A couple of Super Bowls to his credit. Still loves the game. That's why he's still playing. And he's here in the XFL. Kowalski going to run up the man. In the red zone, getting balls in the end zone. On the, con- this time. on the conversion, no, nothing free here. And Pulaski really got the idea of that XFL rule with Rubio and Crawford in his face. Told and you he's so, throwing another gift. Yes, yeah, he gave it to him. And again, the emotions rising here with the Demons and the Outlaws. I also had a really, really good running back. And he's the guy that most people remember when they remember the XFL. It was Rod Smart. And on the back of his jersey, he had, he hate me. Rod Smart taking the ball in. He's putting the work hard. Yeah. And he's the guy that gives him the touchdown. Well, they certainly do hate him. He hate me with a touchdown here for the visiting outlaws. And so whenever people come up to me about the XFL and talk to me about it, first thing out of their mouth is, he hate me. To this day, I still don't know what that means. But it was part of that whole pub thing that the league was going for. They wanted you to put a nickname on there. They wanted you to create controversy, create something, some buzz that people would talk about. What happened after the extra point? You didn't seem happy down there. Uh, 44 was trying to dig his fingers into my eyes. So, you know, if you want to play that way, it's a little cheap, but so be it. Whoa. <laughs> Thanks, Jim, because I didn't see that. That was a beautiful thing. That's Mike Crawford. Come on, wow. Bob. That's that's really BS no, right there. No, no, I'm saying it's a beautiful thing that we caught that. that oh, no, oh. Even, <laughs> even though I'm on that side, <laughs> yeah. I was never an eye gouger. I always wondered how those hands could hold nubbies. At one point in this game, we keep throwing corner routes on them, and we keep completing corner routes on them. And we go back to the well one time too often. And... As I'm going to call it up, my center actually snaps it early. And I reach down, because I see the ball, and I reach down to catch the ball. And so I take my eyes off the safety. I don't have an opportunity to either freeze him or look him off. And when I come back up, I try to fire that corner out. Oh! Boy, 20! 24 out of 32. Oh, 20! A monster oh. game. Look out! Oh. Recovers and still fires. Oh! It's like intercepted by Sanders! I believe that he was taken down. I think it was a face mask. Nevertheless, third turnover. They get a pick. He, they're coming back our way. The, the DB pitches the ball back. And as that happens, one of our offensive linemen grabs the pitch man, and I get blocked from the back. I think it was our center who got blocked into me, and I was just getting up. And so he's coming this way. I'm just getting up. My center gets blocked into my back. He literally hits me and pushes me. And I go head first into the, the ball carrier who had been swung by our offensive tackle. And it literally hits me square on top of my head. And I didn't know it at the time, but I actually broke my neck on that play. I retired 
the day after the game when I couldn't feel my arms and when it got hard to breathe. But I went and saw my spinal injection guy, and he looked at it on the fluoroscope. He's like, no, you'll be fine. You just put some of this in there and see how you feel. And literally, as soon as the cortisone kicked in, I felt a ton better. And so I unretired. Pat Barnes got two games where he, he got to play and be the starting quarterback. He deserved a lot more than that. Uh, but then after that second game, I came back in again. So we go on, we finish the season, and we beat Las Vegas the second time we face them to go in and, and get ourselves set up for the playoffs. So we're facing L.A., same team we started the season against, in the final game of the season. And they have gotten much better. Their pass rush was better. Defense was better. Just a better team overall. I'll say this for our receiver group. Those guys in the XFL that I played with our receiver group was probably the fastest group of receivers that I played with at any level, from the NFL to the Canadian League to the Arena League. Just man for man, across the board, total speed, they were the fastest. There were two dudes that were 4'3", there were two dudes that were 4'4", four, four, and maybe one four five. So fast, fast, fast. And of them, Jimmy the Jet Cunningham, who was about that big, I think he was like 5'4", 5'5", was the toughest, bar none. This dude would go across the middle. He'd catch balls everywhere. And I remember when, when Joe Pow Pow brought him in from the CFL, I'm thinking, man, this guy, he's a mighty might. He was a baller, period. Fantastic target, great teammate, quiet, but just got his job done. And so a huge asset to the team. But we're playing L.A., and they keep hitting me. And so at one point, I told one of our super fast guys, I said, here's what I want. You're going to go out. You're going to run high motion and full speed. I want you to run an out route. I just want to complete a pass and get a first down. I was that frustrated. And I said, don't run the go. Don't do anything else. You're going to go in high motion and you're going to run an out route. He has to honor your speed. He has to back off. We're going to hit the out route against this dude on the outside. Just do that. And so I'm in shotgun. I'm expecting him to run back, hit high motion, and run the out route. I was going to complete one, move the chains. Blue 90! Out of the shotgun on fourth and ten. Blue James Hunden in forward motion. A big fourth down try for San Francisco, and that even, not even close. Who the heck was he throwing to on that? I send him back. He comes down hill full speed. That DB is 20 yards at the snap of the ball. I drop back. I throw the out route, and he runs the go. And I was not unclear. Run the out. Run the out. I don't care if you, I don't care if he's trying to press you at the line. Run the out. He ran the go. And when he came back, he looked at me and he said, Dog, I had him. And I'm like, I don't know what to do at this point. So frustrating game. Towards the end of the game, I get thrown into a pile, tear my rotator cuff on my throwing shoulder. So once again, Pat Barnes has to bail us out. We go down to Orlando. Barnesy goes down there, gets a win versus the Rage. Finally, we play in that championship game against the Extreme, back against L.A. Here we go. Demons alert. Remember, we've got to be more physical now. Be more physical. Go stack left. Demons alert. Slant check with me. All right, ready? And we needed to put together a way better game than we did last time we played them. Well, we didn't do it. Offense sputtered. Couldn't run the ball. We completed some passes, but we couldn't score. We couldn't put it in the end zone. So we ended up getting our ass kicked in the big game at the end, which is what they call it. And you would think a marketing genius could have come up with a better name than that. But uh, LA Extreme won it. Tommy Maddox got the cup. Everybody on that team got $25,000. I don't remember what we got. We did get a, bon we did get a bonus for going to the game, but the winner got $25,000 per man, and the losing team got like seven or something. It was an interesting season. Uh, I didn't know it, but that Vegas game where I broke my neck, that was my career-ending injury. That was the last time I was going to play. It was that season in the XFL. And so I had great teammates, loved them. Guys like Scotty Adams, you know, my right tackle, fantastic. Dudes that I totally respect. Jamie Reeder, who's our fullback. You know, Pat Barnes, obviously my teammate. The defensive guys, Kevin Case Baharn, who I think went on to like an 11-year NFL career. So some great teammates, some great coaches, a great experience. Uh, and it was my 11th year pro playing in that league. And so um, got to really enjoy it, get back on the big field and realize 
how much open space there was on the big field compared to the Arena League. So I had the opportunity to play for seven teams in four different leagues over the course of 11 years, experience every type of football that was available in North America at the time, uh, and really just have a great career that I could look back on and enjoy. Everywhere where I got to be the starter, I either went to or won a championship from two bowl games at Cal, Arena Bowl Championship, XFL Championship game, uh, and just so had a great career. Got to play the position I love, got to play the game that I love, and got to be around great dudes, great coaches, uh, and people that all pulled on the rope at the same time with the same purpose. My experience in the XFL was great. Not everybody's was, but I enjoyed it outside of the injury. Uh, but got a viewer question today about what life in the XFL was like, and that was the XFL 1.0. I know XFL 3.0 is supposed to be coming back in 2023. Rock, if you're out there, I'd love to broadcast it for you. But that's XFL in a nutshell. Working hard, playing the game you love, around people you love, and trying to make it happen for that life experience and, and for the competition of it all, right? As football players, we love to compete. I love to compete. I love to win. I love to go head-to-head. -head. And the XFL gave me the opportunity. 